Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Central Baptist Paragold Campus Online. Uh, so many of you know that we are at the uh, Paragold Community Center right now. So we are diving in today uh, to the very end of our Family February series online. And then we're also going to be together in person. So I am technically preaching two sermons at the exact same time. Crazy, right? Uh, anyway, but listen, we're so excited that you're tuned in, that you're joining with us wherever you are, and hopefully this entire entire series over this last month has been helpful and beneficial and has blessed you, blessed your family, caused you to think. And um, so I'm excited for us to be able to dive into this last week of Family February. And we are preaching a passage of scripture that I am insanely excited to preach because number one, I have never preached it before. And number two, I've never seen or heard someone else preach it. It's a very unique passage of scripture, but I think it is incredibly applicable to you and your family. So before we dive into this passage of scripture in Luke chapter two, so if you got a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. Um, I want to share with you uh, an interesting phenomenon that is happening in our world. Matter of fact, it's been happening for uh, the last few decades, but it is the idea of researching your ancestry. Uh, there's websites now like, uh, you know, uh, uh, 23andMe.com or Ancestry.com, and there's, there's many more uh, where you can uh, research to a certain extent, and then you uh, pay a fee, and then you are able to really find out a lot about your family. And a lot of people are very fascinated to learn more about who their family was and, and where their family was originally from or as far back as you can tell where was your family from and I myself have, have done some research as well. I've, I've went back and studied the Ligon family and, and found out that in the 1600s, a man named Thomas Ligon was the first Ligon to step foot on uh, United States soil. And uh, so interesting, he was a farmer. And so there's a lot of interesting characteristics about him and was able to go back even further and learn more about my family from France and from England and really interesting history with my family. I also found out that there's a club, a Ligon club, uh, I even petitioned to be a part of it, and they said, well, you've got to pay like $400, and I was like, I'm not going to pay to be a part of a club that I have my last name for. Um, so anyway, so that's a side note. Uh, but what people are really fascinated with is their story. They want to learn more about their history, but the purpose of that is so that they can learn more about themselves. You know, when people, when I personally and when other people, and I've asked them, like, you know, why are you doing this? Why am I seeking out who my family is and what our story is? Ultimately, my purpose is not only uh, intrigue and interest, but also, like, I want to know more about who I am. I want to learn more about what makes me tick and why I uh, do this and don't do that and do that and don't do this. And so I want to learn more about who I am. We always are fascinated with learning from our family. And the reason why I share that with you today is we are going to learn today from Jesus's family. We're going to peel back the curtain to look at one of their uh, family stories that I'm sure they would have told often as Jesus was growing up after this moment took place. And we're going to be able to glean from that, just like if we were to look into our own family histories and learn some things about who we were and what type of people our families were. We're also going to be able to look today into Jesus's family to hopefully shape who we are, and not only who we are, but how our family can operate. We're going to look at Jesus's family and see how his family can impact our families, how his parents and how their relationship can shape our own homes even today. There's not a lot of passages of scripture, scripture about Jesus's family, about his home life. We don't know a whole lot after his birth and after he was a few years old, except for in this passage of scripture. And we oftentimes skip past it. We don't really think much about it. But I think there's a few powerful, biblical, and simple principles that we learn from Jesus' family as we look back into his story that can impact our story. So I want to invite you to join with me today as we look at a few biblical principles. Matter of fact, we're going to look at actually eight biblical principles from Jesus' family that you and I can take and apply to our own family so that we can be the family that God has called us to be. So join with me as we dive into Jesus' family story and how it can apply to our own life. So join with me in Luke chapter two, beginning in verse 41. 
Luke tells us now his parents, we know that was Mary and Joseph, they went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy stayed behind in Jerusalem and his parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And then verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature, in favor with God and man. Hey, join me as we pray together, wherever you are, as we dive into a family story of Jesus and look at, glean from this story, how we can apply this also to our own family. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for technology and the ability to take your word and by your spirit, wherever we all are this morning and impact families, impact husbands, wives, and students, children, by your word. Father, you have placed us in the families that we are in for a reason. God, you've given us this story for a reason. And so, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would use the story of of your son and one of the stories of his upbringing, uh, Lord, you would use it to bless and build families here and now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. So here's what we're gonna do today. I've already shared this a little bit, but I wanna go a little bit further. We're gonna walk through this passage again and we're gonna pull out a few biblical principles. Uh, We're not gonna spend a, a lot of time on them, but there are eight, I believe, really significant biblical principles that we can glean from this story and apply to our family. The first principle is this. As a family, according to or or inspired by Jesus' family, we can, one, we can also commit to spiritual rhythms. Commit to spiritual rhythms or spiritual disciplines or spiritual habits. Commit to spiritual rhythms. Look back with me at verse one. It says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So I wanna pause right there. What Mary and Joseph were doing was continuing a tradition that the Jews had done for centuries, which was every year going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. This was, would have been a very important tradition for them. And so Mary and Joseph got 12-year-old Jesus, and for 12 years before that, they had brought him to Jerusalem. It was a, it was a rhythm. It was a ritual. It was a tradition. It was a discipline that they committed themselves to do every year. Listen, Pastor Chuck did a phenomenal job last week talking about rhythms. I'm going to reference that sermon multiple times and habits and spiritual disciplines. I'm going to reference that multiple times here. But listen, you have rhythms in your family. You have disciplines that you've committed to, whether you really think through it or not. And the first principle that I really want you to think about in regards to committing to spiritual rhythms is think through your family's rhythms. What do you do before dinner? Do you sit down at a table? Do you pray? What do you do at bedtime with your kids or your students? What do you do in the morning times when you're driving them to school or maybe when you send off your teenager before they drive themselves to school? What do you do right there in those moments? What do you do when you wake up in the morning and everyone is there together? Those are opportunities for rhythms. Mary and Joseph were committed to a yearly rhythm, but also... They were also, I'm sure, very committed to daily, weekly rhythms as as traditional and devout Jews. What are you committing to as a family? Are there moments where you both personally and also as a family spend time in God's word, spend time in prayer together, 
Coming to church, that's a rhythm. That's a weekly rhythm. A lot of families really struggle with being consistent and faithful in attending church. And, you know, there's a lot of other commitments out there, a lot of other things that they're focused on or, or wanting to go towards. And, and I want to really challenge and, and, and encourage you to think through what rhythms are you placing in front of your family? Because your rhythms will determine your legacy. I want to say that again, and I really want you to think through there. Your daily rhythms will determine your legacy as a family. You know, some things that we do as a family, um, I'm not going to go through all the things that we do, but I've shared a lot of these publicly with you guys before, but uh, before, de- before bed, we pray with our uh, children, just a simple prayer. We share with them a few affirmations. Uh, when we're in the car and when we're driving to school, we've got about 12 minutes before we get to my daughter's school first, and, and we do a little catechism, and this week we've been studying about what is grace? What is grace? And they've been memorizing that answer, and then also Ephesians 2 verse 8, for by grace you have been saved. It's simple. It's not hard. It literally tells me exactly what to do. I just, we, we do that. It's a rhythm we have when we drive. Before we, uh, or after we eat dinner, uh, most nights we eat at the table and we, we don't have our phones. We call the table the no phone zone. And uh, our kids will hold us accountable to that too, for sure. But after we eat a meal and we talk about their highs and their lows, we, we do that foundations book that we talk about and we read a small section of scripture together and just answer the questions and kind of do some of that stuff. You don't have to do all those things. You don't really have to do any of those things specifically. Come up with your own rhythms, but think through you and your spouse or maybe just you, think through your rhythms. What are you committing to daily and weekly and monthly? Listen, those rhythms have the power to shape the trajectory of your children's lives. Small choices create long-term impact. Small choices every day create long-term impact. So first biblical principle that we see from Jesus' family is commit to spiritual rhythms. The second is build spiritual community. Build spiritual community. So verse 42, it says, when he was 12 years old, which we're gonna come back to that, they went up according to the custom. So they went up and when it was over, When the feast was ended and they were returning, the boys stayed behind in Jerusalem. The parents did not know it. And so what happens is, uh, y'all know the story, we just read it, but Jesus stays behind. And you may be like, oh no, I don't understand this. How can, there's three of them. And they come to Jerusalem, three of them, and then they leave. How are Mary and Joseph not thinking, okay, we're missing one. There was three when we came. Uh, Well, it's because they traveled with, this passage tells us, relatives and acquaintances. They traveled in a caravan with friends and family. This was a tradition. Not only did they have this spiritual rhythm, but they brought other people along with them. They were doing life as a community with their family and their friends. I want to ask you this question. Who is it that you have around your family? Who are the people that are influencing your kids other than than you? Who are the people that are impacting your teenagers? Listen, we live in the most individualistic culture on the planet and that history has ever known. We believe as Americans in the nuclear family and the nuclear family is a, it's not a Christian term necessarily, but it's the idea of mom, dad, kids, that's it. There's no other influence, it's just, it's just them. And, and what we see is the breakdown of the nuclear family in, in multiple levels and in, in, in multiple places. I know families look so different now. There's all kinds of dynamics within family. But in this situation, what Mary and Joseph were committed to was not only spiritual rhythms, but also spiritual community. They were bringing other people around Jesus to invest in him, to do life with him, to travel on this spiritual journey with him. And so I really want you to think through that. Who are the people in my family's life that are impacting us? Who are the people that are speaking into my life? I want to give you a really fascinating statistic. This is not just like, oh, that's maybe a good idea, a good suggestion. We'll think about that, Blake. I want you to think about this, especially for you who have uh, young kids that are still in your home. The number one factor. You know, they do research on these kids who grow up in church and then go off to college. They, they, They research them extensively. And you know what they've discovered? The number one factor for your student 
staying involved in the church for the rest of their life, do you know what the number one factor is? There's multiple factors, but the most consistent factor for a student staying in the church whenever they leave and they don't have to go to church anymore because they're not living with you under your house, do you know what that factor is? Significant relationships with other Jesus-loving adults. Significant relationships with adults in the church who are not in the immediate family. That if your child has built a solid relationship with maybe their, uh, their Sunday school teacher, life group teacher, maybe their pastor or ministry staff, if they've built significant relationships with friends that, that you also share, people that you do life with that are in the church, if they have felt, if they feel belonging with those people, then that is the number one factor that your child will stay connected to the church for the rest of their life. I don't know about you, but I want my children to be lifelong committed followers of Jesus and the local church. I want them to love the local church. It's not perfect, but I want them to love it. And the way that I can influence that most effectively other than my prayers is by bringing other people in the church around them. It's one of the reasons why Joy and I host our D groups in our homes. That's why we often have people over to our houses or rarely turn down an invitation when someone invites us to their house. It's messy and it's crazy and it's loud, but that is shaping our kids because spiritual community impacts your family's legacy and the trajectory of your children and your students. The third principle that we see here is recognize spiritual milestones. Recognize spiritual milestones. So not only commit to spiritual rhythms and to spiritual community, but recognize spiritual milestones. I wanna hop back up and say, this passage did not have to record for us how old Jesus was, but it did. And I think there is a significance to that. It tells us that he is 12 years old. That is an incredibly important age, especially uh, for young Jewish boys and young Jewish girls. We know that for the Jewish boy, uh, he would have had a bar mitzvah when he was 13. It's a, it's a powerful ceremony where ultimately he is declared a man, that he is now entering into a season of manhood and, and he is now a part of the, the tribe of, of, of men. He's no longer seen as a boy. He is seen as a man and he has taught the ways of a man. Typically also it would be the times where he begins to learn his father's trade and, and he is seen in the community as a man and the girls have a very similar uh, celebration as well. But this age is so vital. And I want to encourage you, if you've got, some of you may not have kids here yet. Some of you may, your kids are already past this. But if you've got a student in your life who's about 12 or 13 years old, I want to encourage you. This is a vital, in the eyes of God, not even in my opinion, in the eyes of God, this is a vital moment for them. And I want to invite you and encourage you and inspire you to think through how how you can intentionally invest in your child when they're 12 to 13 years old, when they're sixth, seventh grade. I've got some really great resources uh, for, for sons, uh, but also there's some great resources for dad of thinking through ceremonies and rituals and different things to impact your child. You need to recognize spiritual milestones. Other milestones you need to consider if you've got uh, younger kids is when they go to kindergarten. When they go to kindergarten, doing something special for them in that moment, maybe just taking them out and celebrating them that weekend, praying over them and giving them just a quick word of encouragement to be, a, be, to be someone who's kind or be someone who's strong or be someone who's courageous, but just making that a moment, really signifying that. Another great milestone to recognize is, is when your kid starts to drive, when they turn 16 and before that you just give them the keys and go on, make something special out of it. Bring some adults around them and take them to dinner and just say, hey, there's great responsibility with this and hey, you're gonna get tempted with different things and, and uh, with, with driving and the freedom that you have with driving and you've gotta pay attention because this is a bigger responsibility. Make that a moment. Recognize the milestone when they graduate high school. Do something significant when they turn 18. Recognize the milestone of them about to be married. I just recently read a book by Robert Lewis and 
he has a ceremony for each one of his sons. He had three sons and he had a ceremony for each one of his sons the night before they got married where he brought other men into their life and they had a really nice uh, kind of a dessert time because I'd already eaten the rehearsal dinner and they sat around for a couple of hours and just prayed over his son, shared with him wisdom and they laughed and they enjoyed each other. Recognize that, recognize spiritual milestones and take advantage of those. We've lost that in our culture. Uh, we've lost that. And so this one of my passions is to uh, create moments uh, within those milestones to be able to really form our kids to be uh, devout followers of Jesus. Now, here's the fourth principle is we need to encourage open lines of communication. Encourage open lines of communication. So We've already looked at, they had spiritual rhythms. They were going every year. They were, had spiritual community. They were doing this with other people, friends and family. Uh, also recognized milestones. Jesus was 12 years old when this moment took place. Recognized that there's significance in that season, but also open lines of communication. So Jesus decides that he is going to stay back in Jerusalem. He's not gonna go with the caravan of people, which by the way, that's why Mary and Joseph uh, didn't realize. They thought he was just kind of in the group, like, oh yeah, he's back there somewhere, we'll be fine. And they left for an entire day. And then they realized like, hey, where's our son that God also said is his own son? Uh, that person, we need to find him. And so they had to go back. That's why. But when they went back and started to look for him, they found him in the temple. They found him in the temple and Mary is distraught. I mean, you can, you can see that in this text. I mean, she, she responds to him, we have been searching for you with great distress. Right before that, she says, why have you done this to us? Why have you treated us like this? Why, why did you decide to stay back and, and, and hide yourself here in the temple and, and teaching? And she was hurt, she was frustrated and she was honest about that. And in Jesus's response, listen, he's honest back with, back with her. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Notice here, there's no name calling. There's no, um, there's no bitterness. There's no, uh, no one saying anything. They're just like, oh, okay, Jesus, let's go. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no lack of communication. Both Mary and Jesus are very honest with each other. And I think there's a principle here that we need to pull for our own families, and that's to pursue and encourage open lines of communication. It is amazing to me, as I do ministry and, and walk with families, how communication is one of the most, the single most de detrimental and deformed qualities of families. They don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to talk. Husbands sometimes don't know how to talk without getting extremely angry when there's a situation. Wives don't know how to, how to sometimes talk without being passive aggressive uh, or to just being com not saying anything, not bringing anything up. As I was thinking about this in regards to communication, um, you have some people that are the screamers the screamers, and y'all know some of those families, maybe that's your family, maybe that's the family you grew up in, but anytime anything happens, everybody just starts screaming. Sometimes it's not even a bad situation, like they just all scream. They'll be over in different areas of the house, hey, are we all doing this? No, we're not doing that. You know, it's just like just screaming back and forth. But when there's a conflict, like here in this passage, this is a conflict, this is a problem here between Mary and Jesus. When there's a conflict in a, a screaming home, everybody screams at each other. Everybody yells, everybody explodes, everybody blows up. Nobody knows how to, how to control their anger. They're screamers, maybe that's your family. You have the others that not only are screamers, they're complete opposite, they're sweepers. They're sweepers. Nobody pursues open and honest communication because anytime there's a conflict, they just sweep it under the rug. Anytime someone messes up or does something wrong, they don't address it, they don't talk about it, they just sweep it under the rug. A lot of times that's because there's one, one family member who's a screamer, one who's like just extremely passionate or dogmatic or just mean. And so everyone else in the family adapts to that one person. Maybe it's dad, maybe it's mom, but they adapt to that person and they sweep everything under the rug. Oh, don't say anything to mom about that. You know what she'll do. Well, don't say anything to dad. You know that what he's gonna do. They're sweepers. They're not pursuing open communication. 
But you don't have to be a family who screams at each other all the time. And you also don't have to be a family who sweeps everything under the rug. You can be like Jesus's family who pursues open and honest communication. Mary was honest with Jesus. She knew who he was. She remembered all the dreams and visions that God had given her. She saw how that she knew who he was. And yet she came to him as a mother would a son, frustrated and, and upset. And Jesus responds to her honestly. He's not rude to her or dishonoring her. He does not dishonor her. But he shares honestly what's going on in his own heart. We have a saying in our family uh, often that says, express your heart. Express your heart. Matter of fact, just a few mornings ago, I was asking my son, I was like, son, what emotion do you feel right now and why? Because I could tell something was off with him. Something was going on with him. And so I said, what emotion do you feel and why? Share it with me. And he opened up and shared with me about a few things. Listen, that is, that is uh, the culture that Joy and I have wanted to create within our own family, not because we're geniuses or experts in communication, because we realize communication is vital to a family. What about your family? How do, you, how do, how do y'all communicate with each other? You know, husbands and wives, do, do, do they see y'all, do your kids see you screaming at each other, yelling at each other from other rooms? Whenever there's a conflict, you just blow up on each other. Do they see that? Or do they see y'all just not ever communicating, not ever being on the same page, just sweeping everything under the rug? Whenever there's a hurt, sweep it under the rug. A conflict, sweep it under the rug. Whenever there's an issue, sweep it under the rug. Listen, I believe God wants us to have open and honest communication within our homes. I've told you guys before in multiple sermons where I've had to go back to my own children who were in elementary school and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Dad sinned. And you, think, you don't think that hurts? You don't think that kind of hits my pride a little bit or thinking I don't need to apologize to a child? No, I do. Because we want to pursue open and honest communication. How is your communication within your family? That's a, that's a, a principle that we can pull from this story. The fifth principle I think that we see here is honor your parents. Honor your parents. Now what Jesus does after they've had this this honest communication with each other, what Jesus does is it says that he was submissive to his parents. They went back down to Nazareth and he was submissive to his parents. He honored his mom and his dad, Joseph. He honored them. You know, God always calls us in his word, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament to honor our parents. That doesn't mean that we always have to agree with them. A matter of fact, in this story, we know that Jesus has never and, and ever did sin. So he didn't sin in this story even when he was 12. But yet, he honored his parents. He was doing what his father wanted him to do. His heavenly father was wanting to do it. And he, but he honored his parents. He did what they asked him to do. He went back with them to Nazareth. I want to talk to the students for just a moment. Would you say that you're your relationship with your parents is characterized by honor. Do you honor them? When they tell you to do something that you don't agree with or you don't like, what do you say to them? How do you act towards them? I would encourage you to take a cue from Jesus when he himself was 12 years old and honor them. Submit to their authority. Now, I do wanna make a caveat here. Uh, I wanna make a, a, a very important note that that does not mean that we need to submit to any type of abuse. That if, that if you're experiencing a, an abuse within your home, that doesn't mean that you just need to continue to be submissive to or honor your parents even when an abuse is taking place. And I just wanna encourage you, if you have gone through any type of abuse, I, I wanna encourage you, and I know that it's an, it, incredibly, incredibly hard to talk about that or to bring that to light, but I want to, I wanna pray for you and encourage you to bring that to light, to talk about that to share that with someone that is uh, trusted and that can handle that information. So it doesn't mean that you're, you're called to be submissive to abuse. But if there's not abuse taking place and there's not sin that your parents are asking you to do, and I'm just gonna go ahead and share with you that cleaning your room or doing chores is not a sin. I know it feels like it, but it's not. But you are called to honor your parents now I'm speaking to the students, but I also wanna to speak to the grown adults, the ones who are watching this that are probably the majority of people who you have kids or maybe you're married or you're just, you're an adult, but you have 
parents who are still alive and, and still with you. Now your calling is no longer to be submissive to them, to obey them, but your calling is to honor them, to, to listen to them. Not to do what they say all the time, but to honor them, to honor them. The sixth principle that I think is important for us to, to, to pull from and to apply to our family is to treasure each season. To treasure each season. We've got a couple more after this. And so here's what Mary does. After Jesus, after this whole story takes place, after Jesus is in the temple, they find him, he's submissive to them, they go back. Scripture tells us that Mary treasures all these things in her heart. She takes time to just pause and to enjoy the stage of life she's in and what is happening in that stage. To treasure the season. I I know for for many of you, you're like me and you've got young kids still at home. And honestly, at times, we all know this, it can be extremely difficult. When you've got a toddler screaming or yelling at you or you go and you clean up a room only to discover that after you go back, the room is destroyed again or there is chocolate on the chair, uh, which I experienced yesterday uh, while while we were cooking dinner and doing everything. Uh, Kids are hard and having young kids is tough sometimes. They want every bit of your attention and your focus and it's difficult and there can a lot of times be this temptation to just be like, gracious, I wish that you a little older. I wish that you could talk a little better so that we can communicate. Or I wish that uh, this was not the stage we were in. Or I wish that you could clean up after yourself. Or I wish that you could drive and go get this uh, thing at Walmart for us because I don't know who's going to do this right now. There's tons of sometimes wishes that creep up into our heart where we're uh, longing for uh, the next season. We're longing for, okay, I can't wait till you can walk. Or I can't wait till you can do this. Or I can't wait for you to do that because it'll be so much easier once that takes place. And I find myself often doing that, uh, wishing for the next season. And as I was studying this passage of scripture, if I'm just being totally honest, uh, God convicted me to treasure the season that I'm in with my children. It is difficult and it's crazy and it's hard. um, But to really step back for a moment and realize that my children are the age that they are in the moment that we're in for a reason. And so I need to treasure them. I, and I'm sharing that with, uh, I know a lot of the moms, man, you're, you're just, you're worn out. I, I, I hear you and I see you and I, I'm not a mom, obviously, and I don't understand the pressures and the stresses and the mom guilt that you experience. But I wanna encourage you that even in the midst of Cheerios and dirty diapers and chaos and screaming and dinner and everything else going on, uh, God sees you. And even in this chaos, he, he encourages you. And I want to encourage you, just treasure this season. This was a chaotic moment for Mary. I mean, think about it. She lost her kid. And not it was just her kid. This kid was to be the son of God, the savior, the Messiah of the world. Can you imagine the, oh oh God, this is not good. I lost the son that you gave me. I mean, this would have been a pretty terrifying moment for her. And yet... Minutes or maybe hours after she found Jesus, they had this interaction. It says that she's treasuring those things in her heart. Mama, I I, want to encourage you, whatever season of life you're in, whatever stage of life your children are in, I want to encourage you to pray towards and to just step back for just a moment. And it may even be for three seconds before someone needs you again. But just treasure where God has you. Treasure in your heart, your children, the stage that they're in right now. And that they're there in your home under, under, under your leadership, under your care to treasure, to enjoy, and to build up. Dad's the same thing. Man, your kids are not obstacles to your career or to your hobby. God has given you them so that you can also treasure them. Do your children feel that you treasure them? That you prize them? not over God, but that you are excited that they are in the stage that they're in and they're with you in your home. That's the sixth principle. Now I wanna wrap this entire passage of scripture up with just two major truths. 
two things that I want you to think about that really turned me on to this story. And the first one is this, kind of an overarching truth for this passage is number one, this, give yourself grace. Give yourself grace. Let's think about this story for just a moment. We pulled out some really great biblical principles that we need to apply to our family. They're not suggestions. I think they are imperatives for us to have a godly, thriving home. Remember the tagline for this whole series is theology for a thriving home. You need to think through some of these things. But I want us to step back for a second, look at the whole story, the whole picture. And one of the principles that I think you and I need to apply is to give yourself grace. Give yourself God's grace. Think about this. Mary and Joseph were entrusted by God to take care of the Messiah. Half parents of Jesus to take care of the Messiah. And in this moment right here, they messed up. They, they got in the caravan and they started going down the road and literally for an entire day did not realize that they left the Messiah back in Jerusalem. They messed up. They made a mistake. And it put them in great distress. I mean, it really, it bothered them. They were running all over the city looking for this 12-year-old boy. Parents, I, I, want, I, want, to, I want you to realize this. These are the two people that God, the God of the universe decided to entrust his own son to. Knowing that they were gonna mess it up. Knowing that they weren't gonna get it right all the time. Listen, parents, God has given your children to you. Knowing that, you're not always gonna get it right. You're gonna make mistakes. Some of you are carrying around guilt for, for just bad decisions you made. Giving your kids something that they're allergic to or getting extremely angry with them when they did something or said something or yelling at their, at their mom or yelling at their dad or yelling at their grandparents. I don't know what it is, but some of you are carrying around some some real shame and real guilt for some of the mistakes that you've made. And I, I wanna encourage you with this, to give yourself grace. If Jesus, if Jesus Christ's parents didn't get it right all the time, listen, then you too and I too should give ourselves grace. I recently had a conversation with a man who uh, didn't get saved till later on in life. And so uh, honestly, he, he carries a lot of regret. He carries a lot of regret about, you know, what he didn't do as a dad and what he did do as a dad, that he's like, man, I just shouldn't have done that and I shouldn't have done this and I didn't need to do this as a husband. And I've talked to him multiple times and sometimes he'll, he'll kind of beat himself up. Uh, he'll, he'll feel bad about the things that he fell short on, he feels like, things that he could have done better. And I was talking with him the other day and I just shared very simply with him, hey brother, listen, you need to give yourself grace. And then I said, listen, you're not dead. You're not dead. And he kind of looked at me for a second. I said, you still have time. You've made mistakes. You need, you need to give yourself the grace that God has given you through Christ. Forgive yourself and then repair it. Patch it up. Say you're sorry. Fix whatever situation. Go back to your spouse. Go back to your children. Maybe they're grown. Maybe some of you are listening right here and, and you've got grandchildren and you've had some, some issues with, with their parents, with your own children. And you've got this regret and I made this mistake, I made that mistake and I drank too much or I worked too hard or I cared more about my hobbies than my kids. You're not dead. Go tell them that. Give yourself grace and then go share with them, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't do this. I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't tell you I loved you as much as I should have. I'm sorry that I was hard on you. I'm sorry that I was a workaholic or I'm sorry that, uh, that, that I didn't treat your mom right or I didn't treat your dad right. I'm sorry. You'll be amazed at the grace that you receive when you give yourself grace. So stop being so hard on yourself. Jesus' parents didn't always get it right. The second truth, and we're gonna end with this this, this, uh, this morning together, is to not only give yourself grace, but also give your parents grace. Give your parents grace. Now, I want you to think about this, Jesus in this story. Jesus was doing what he uh, was supposed to be doing. He was in his father's house, in the temple. And it's a really cool story about what Jesus was doing here and, and teaching, and everyone's really interesting. He was doing what he was supposed to do. And his parents got really angry, and you know that whole, we've already seen the story. But what does Jesus do? 
Does he look at them and he shame them? Does he look at them and say, well, how, how, why, what is wrong with y'all? And I, I can't believe God has given me y'all as parents. Like, y'all don't even know what you're doing. No, he didn't. Scripture tells us that he goes back with them. They join the caravan and they go back down to Nazareth where he's from. And it says that he was submissive to his parents. He showed his parents grace. He showed them grace. I, I want to talk to the students first who are watching this, or maybe young people who, who understand this passage, understand what's going on. Listen, give your parents grace. Uh, they don't have a manual. They didn't get a training, uh, a, a training uh, book, a uh, book on how to raise you. Uh, they're figuring out as they go. And, and to be honest, they've made mistakes. They've thought that this is what you needed and you needed something else. They thought that this is the way that you should have done this or done that and they were wrong. And you need to give them grace as they parent you, as they shepherd you, as they lead you. They've got tons of wisdom, so much wisdom, but they're not always gonna get it right. And so show them grace. Realize that they need Jesus just like you do. But I also not only wanna apply that to students, but I also wanna apply that to the grown person who's watching this. To the people, you, you've got kids of your own. Maybe you're a grandparent yourself and you went through a really hard time as a kid. You had, you had some issues, uh, some struggles, and most of them were brought on by your parents or your family or maybe just one of your parents. And listen, I, 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 I'm not gonna stand here and, and give an excuse for what you've gone through and and say that your parents were, you know, just, well, you just need to get over what they did. No, I recognize there's some real hurt that many of you have gone through with your families. But I wanna encourage you that by the grace and help of God to get to a place where you can show grace to your parents, where you can realize that they didn't have it right, they didn't always get it right, they, they sometimes they made mistakes and sometimes they sinned. When you don't forgive somebody or when you don't show them grace, the only person it hurts is you, is me. And so I wanna encourage you, listen, Jesus' parents left him and then they didn't understand why he was there and yet he still showed them grace. They didn't get it right, they messed up, but he showed them grace. And I wanna encourage you with that same principle, the last principle. Give your parents grace. Your parents may, honestly, your parents may have already passed away. You need to get with Jesus today, this afternoon, this morning, and ask him to help you put grace in your heart towards your, towards your dad or towards your mom or towards maybe a sibling. Doesn't give them permission to do it again. It doesn't say that whatever they did to you or whatever sin that they decided to, to, to hurt you with doesn't mean that they get, they get a, a, an opinion for that or they get a, 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 it's okay. No, when you forgive somebody, you're not saying, oh, it's okay. When you forgive someone, you're saying, I'm no longer holding bitterness and anger and hatred towards you. I forgive you because Christ has forgiven me. Some of you watch this entire sermon just so you can have that truth. I wanna share with you one last story as we bring all this together. Uh, I was uh, recently, a few years ago, obviously I was pastoring, I was in ministry. I'm, I'm in ministry, I'm a pastor at a church and um, I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants in regards to being a parent. Um, I hadn't ever really thought through uh, my children's thoughts about the church. I haven't thought about, I didn't ever think about my children's thoughts about God's word. We, we weren't really, we were praying, but we weren't really like discipling our children. We weren't being intentional. We, we didn't have these rhythms. We weren't really bringing in spiritual community. We, our communication wasn't that great. We, I didn't know anything about milestones and about making memories in certain moments for my kid's life. Uh, all these things I, I had never really thought about before. I'd never Never thought about being intentional about my family. I just thought be reactional instead of intentional. Like a lot of families are reactional. Let's just react to whatever's going on every day. 
And that was me. That was, that was, that was me leading my family. It was just reactional. Just, let's just keep doing what kind of whatever the day brings. And I remember sitting down, I was in a D group setting and uh, uh, a good friend of mine, and many of you know him, Bill Lewis, was sharing his testimony. And he was talking about his own family. And he made the comment while we were all sitting there, uh, after he had talked about how his dad was a pastor and his mom was just an extremely godly woman. They had a godly family. They loved Jesus. And he made a comment that really, I mean, truly, this was three and a half years ago, I think, or close to it. He made a comment that has really stuck with me and changed the trajectory of my life. He said, I can never remember a time where my parents did not connect each day back to God's word. There, there was never a situation, he said, that they didn't connect it back to God's word. There wasn't ever a meal where we weren't talking about the word of God and Jesus and his grace and his mercy and his cross and his resurrection. He said, I can never remember a time where my family was not intentional. My parents were not intentional about the word of God. And when I heard that as a pastor, it hit me all the way to my soul. And I realized that I needed to change some things. I realized that I needed and, 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 and needed to rally Joy and I up to get intentional about how we were raising our children, what rhythms we were putting in place, what things we began to do. And so I began to read books on family discipleship and books on, uh, I started looking up my own family history. There was a lot of things that I began to pursue because I was convicted that I was not leading my family the way God had called me and equipped me to lead. And it wasn't anything crazy that we started doing. They were simple daily rhythms. And so I wanna encourage you as we wrap this entire series up to sit back for a moment and think about, pray and ask God, God, how am I leading my family? What can we do to point our children to Jesus in a better way? What rhythms do we need to take out, God? And what rhythms do we need to put in? My question to you is when, you're, when your children are Bill Lewis's age and you're gone and they're sitting around a, a small group of people and they're talking about your family. Man, I want this to sink in. I really want you to think through this. This is so important. When your children talk about your marriage and your family one day, when you're gone, what are they gonna say? I hope that my children say something very similar to what Bill Lewis said that, that night on my back porch. So I want us to pray together. I wanna to encourage you to talk with your spouse or think through by yourself how you can put these rhythms into your life. We've learned from Jesus's family. Now let's go and apply this to our own family. Let's pray together and we will wrap up this morning together. Father, we love you. And we love you because you first loved us. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bless and help and equip families to be the family that you've called them to be. God, you care. You have intentionally placed us in the families that we're in. And so Father, I pray in the name of Jesus um, that you would bless and build up these families who are, who are engaged in this moment right now. That Father, you would teach them, inspire them, and help them to put spiritual rhythms, spiritual community, open communication. God, all these things we talked about, God, put those things into the rhythms and the fabric of the families who are watching this. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hey, I wanna invite you, so glad you guys joined us today. I wanna invite you to join back with us uh, next week, uh, March 5th. We are gonna be back at the fairgrounds and we're diving back into the book of Hebrews. So I wanna encourage you to be a part of that. But also, March 5th is going to be Vision Sunday where we are gonna lay out our next steps as a church. I wanna invite you to be a part of that. It's gonna be an awesome Sunday. We love you guys. If we can help you in any way. If anything is going on in your life, if you want to give your life to Jesus or be baptized or join a group or you just got a question, reach out to our church staff. We want to serve you and help you. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you guys next week.